everything the Father does is with purpose. And so as we read through the Bible and we see this scene and we read this conversation, it's really easy for, just to, for us to just gloss over it and not pay much attention to it. And in Matthew 17, at the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah standing there is, there's so much embedded in that. And as I was sharing with you, it's a picture of the two witnesses and who the two witnesses are in the sense that it's the Torah, it's the prophets. I'm not saying that Moses is gonna be one of the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11, but I believe that a Moses will. That, that is someone who represents the natural branch. And likewise, Elijah is there. And if Elijah is a Tishbite because of the people he comes from and the people that he came out of were foreigners and considered to be aliens and strangers, but who have joined themselves to the God of Israel and to the people of Israel and to the land of Israel, they have, if I may, they've taken pleasure in her stones and favored her dust. He represents the wild branch that is grafted into the Messiah, the natural branch that is also in Messiah. And these two as one testify that Yeshua is the Messiah. And so I'm convinced that Elijah is representative of the wild branch. He's representative of those who weren't born ethnically Israeli, but who are because they desired to be part of this family, have become part of this family. It's, it reminds us of Ruth and Naomi and how as Naomi prepared to go back to the land of Israel, to Bethlehem, how Ruth and Orpah are, are told to return to their own people, but Ruth says, no, no, wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people should be my people. Your God shall be my God. And this woman who was born among the nations, an incestuous nation no less, she joins herself to God's people and consequently she becomes an ancestor of King David and the son of David, the Messiah himself. So it's a very important picture that's being painted for us in the transfiguration. A statement is being made about the body of Messiah and who Israel is. It's natural branch, it's ethnically Israeli, but, though, but they have come to be joined to the Messiah and it's those who weren't born ethnically Israeli, but who nevertheless have joined themselves to the Messiah and consequently become part of this family. Now, understanding that, let's go further into Matthew 17 and look at something very interesting that occurs. After he's been transfigured and they're coming down the mountain, the disciples are obviously pondering what they've just seen and the implications and knowing that beyond doubt Yeshua is the Messiah, they're faced with a little bit of a theological dilemma and that is, well, wait a minute. The scribes, the prophecy teachers of their day, the theologians of their day had said that before the Messiah could come, there would have to be these birth pangs that lead to the Messiah. And before the birth pangs come, there would have to be the appearance of Elijah the prophet to come and tell us that these things are about to happen. And of course, this is based on the prophecy in Malachi 4. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children of the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So based on that, the prophecy teachers of their day had interpreted it to mean, well, before Messiah comes, Elijah will come. And so as they're coming down the mountain, they ask him this question in verse 11. Uh, excuse me, they ask him the question of why did the scribes say that Elijah must come? And so his response to them in verse 11 is this. Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. And then we are told that what he was speaking about was John the Baptist. John the Baptist came in the spirit and the power of Elijah but because the prophecy teachers of the day and the theologians of the day had told them to expect the Elijah, their theology got in the way, their interpretation got in the way, and they couldn't see what God was doing right in front of their face. So he says, Elijah did come. You just didn't notice it. But Elijah is going to come, and he will restore all things. And understanding 
that Elijah very likely was not born ethnically Israeli, that he is a picture of the wild branch that is grafted into the rootstock. And of the two that were standing there as witnesses that Yeshua is the Messiah and the son of the living God, notice that it's Elijah who is singled out as restoring all things, not Moses, not the natural branch. But it's the wild branch, if you will, that plays such an important role in the restoration of all things. Remember, on the road to Emmaus, when they went into the house, when did these disciples have their eyes open? When did they realize that this was Yeshua standing before them? It's when he took and he broke the matzah. Then their eyes were open. Well, what's that got to do with Elijah? Well, Jews believe that Elijah will come before the dreadful day of the Lord, that he will come before the birth pangs of the Messiah, and that he will herald the coming of the Messiah. And they believe that he's going to come at Passover. In fact, every Passover Seder in every Jewish home and congregation, there's a part of the Seder where they will stop what they're doing. The children will get up from the table. They'll open the door and they will sing a song called Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah the prophet, Elijah the Gileadite, Elijah the Tishbite. And what are they singing? Well, we're looking for him because if he comes, then we know that right behind him comes the Messiah. They're looking for Elijah at Passover. A plate, a setting, an empty chair is at their table prepared for Elijah. So they're expecting Elijah to come, to sit down with them, to break matzah with them. And that will be the sign that the Messiah is soon to appear. But if Elijah is the wild branch, if Elijah wasn't born ethnically Israeli, but has joined himself to the people of Israel, the God of Israel, then who are our Jewish friends looking for? Who are they expecting to come and to sit down with them, to join them, to be one with them in this covenantal meal and to announce the arrival of the Messiah, to break matzah with them so that their eyes will be opened to the identity of the Messiah. I'll suggest it's you and me. And so my point in all of this is, Messiah says that Elijah comes and restores all things. And we already learn here in Matthew 17 that Elijah doesn't necessarily have to be the Elijah. It might be someone who comes in the spirit and the power of Elijah. The point is, Those born among the nations, among the Gentiles, who have come out of those Gentile ways and beliefs, but have come to join themselves to the Messiah, Yeshua, the Messiah of Israel, play an extremely important point or role in the restoration. They play a very important role in the restoration of all things and the restoration of the kingdom. Now, there's um, a modern rabbi by the name of Yitzhak Ginsburg. He is, in my view, a genius, uh, intellectually anyway, and I've read many of his books. And he is probably one of the greatest minds in Judaism today. Well, he made a fascinating observation about a particular verse in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3 that you and I will find of interest. And that verse, of course, says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Not just Israel, but in you, Abraham, and your seed, all the families of the earth, the nations, the Gentiles, will be blessed. Now, here is um, a word that Rabbi Ginsburg focused on and made this observation, and the term is venivrechu. Venivrechu is translated, shall be blessed. Rabbi Ginsburg made the observation that this same word is used in Midrashic literature when it talks about the grafting of plants. Let me make sure you understand what I'm saying here. He's going into some Jewish commentary and sees in 
some of these ancient writings, some of these rabbis and sages of old, had used this term, venivrechu, translated in Genesis 12, verse 3, as shall be blessed, he sees that they connect it to the grafting of plants. And so he concluded that Genesis chapter 12, verse 3 was saying this, that the Gentiles, one day, the Gentiles, people of the nations, would be grafted into Abraham, thus becoming part of the family of Abraham, then considered, if you will, the seed of Abraham because they were grafted in. He sees that in the very beginning. Remember, Peter said that God has been speaking about the restoration of all things since the world began. Now, Rabbi Ginsburg also made the observation and, and come to the conclusion that it this would happen and come to fruition, be accomplished when the Messiah came. The Messiah would come and through the Messiah, the nations, the people of the nations would be grafted into and become part of the commonwealth of Israel. Now, I have to tell you that Rabbi Ginsburg was not the first rabbi to come to this conclusion. There was another one who trained at the feet of an ancient sage by the name of Gamaliel, and his name was Rav Shaul. We know him as Paul, the apostle. He also came to the same conclusion. And he wrote in Romans chapter 11, I'm gonna read for you verses 17 and verse 24, Paul speaking to those of the nations, to the Gentiles. He says, you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, that is, among those who are part of the cultivated olive tree, and with them, not instead of them, not replacing them, but with them became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Verse 24, you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted, contrary to nature, into a cultivated olive tree. So now, Rabbi Ginsburg made this observation just several years ago, but relatively uh, recent, but Paul made this observation 2,000 years ago. However, what Paul was writing about and what he was trying to get across to these people in Rome wasn't new 2,000 years ago. It wasn't new, to quote a friend of mine, Brad Scott, it was just true. It was something that was already spoken of. Moses had already spoken of this back in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. In you, all the families of the earth will be grafted in. They will become part of the family. Now, again, Jewish expectations were that the Messiah would restore the kingdom to Israel. They expected him to bring an end to the exile and to gather the people. But now we're learning that within Judaism, there was also this expectation that when the Messiah would come, he would graft people of the nations into the commonwealth of Israel, that they would become part of this cultivated olive tree. Now, I'm going to read you something um, from a book that I have that describes why God would choose the olive tree to, to paint a certain picture. It says, because of its potential to live over 1,000 years and still bear fruit, the olive tree has symbolized longevity and immortality. It propagates by putting out shoots or branches, ensuring its continual survival even after its main trunk becomes hollow. It can endure and overcome great obstacles and trials and still survive. It continually drops seed that produces shoots or branches that will eventually bear fruit, thus producing more seed. So that is a description of an olive tree. And again, maybe that's why God chose the olive tree to be a picture of his people Israel, because they were going to have to overcome a lot of hardship. But there's longevity. And the mission is to continually be putting out shoots in Hebrew, the term would be shalach. That would be the root term and the verb form of it, to, put, to shoot out, to branch out. The noun form would be shaliach, sent out, to be sent out. We would say apostles, to be going out there and be scattering seed 
to always be propagating the seed because the seed is going to produce fruit and the fruit's going to produce more seed and that's going to produce more fruit and that's going to produce more seed. That's what the olive tree does. So the, the olive tree becomes emblematic of Israel. More specifically, in Zechariah 4, we have this vision where the prophet sees a menorah, the seven branch candelabra, flanked on either side by two olive branches. And this becomes the emblem for the modern state of Israel. Two olive branches flanking the menorah, the light of the, the, of the tabernacle, the sanctuary, and that becomes the emblem for Israel. My point is this. When Paul is discussing a cultivated olive tree and branches broken off, grafted in, etc., Number one, he's not pulling this out of thin air. He's not making stuff up as he goes along. This is imagery that was already in the Tanakh. More importantly, Paul's making it very clear. The Bible makes it very clear. The olive tree where the branches were broken off, that's Israel. And the branches that get grafted into that olive tree are being grafted into Israel. The olive tree is not the church. It's Israel. And by the way, the word church, it's just a word. We've made it something else, but it's just a word to describe the congregation, the assembly of the Lord, ecclesia, the called out ones. Stephen in Acts chapter 7 says that the church, if you're reading King James, was in the wilderness. Well, I didn't think there was a church until Acts chapter 2. How could the church be in the wilderness? Well, it's because the word church, derived from ecclesia, is just a word that we use in English to describe God's called out ones, His assembly, His people. But biblically, His people are identified as Israel. And so the olive tree in Romans 11 is not the church. It's Israel. Branches were broken off so that branches could be grafted in to Israel. I think what I'm trying to say here is, or what my hope is, what I'm trying to say here, Paul was teaching that people who are not ethnically Israel have been grafted into and have become part of this family known as Israel. Nowhere do we see in what Paul wrote or anything else we can see in Scripture where because branches were broken off of one tree that we then go out and grow our own tree. Let me read in uh, Romans chapter 11, beginning at verse 13. For I speak to you in Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry, if by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are of my flesh and save some of them. For if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some, not all, some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, you're becoming part of this same tree that I've been talking about, in other words, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you don't support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief they were broken off. And you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. All right, so first of all, remember that Paul is not telling us something new. He's telling us something true, something that's already been established in the Scripture. Also remember that Paul trained at the feet of Gamaliel. This man knows the Torah. He knows the prophets. He knows the writings of Scripture. So he's not pulling this concept out of thin air. He's not making something up on the fly. As a matter of fact, in Jeremiah 11, we can see verses that use similar imagery. That is, branches being, brought, uh, being broken off of an olive tree because of their unbelief. In Jeremiah 11, in verse 16, it says, The Lord called your name, he's speaking to Israel, The Lord called your name, green olive tree, lovely and of good fruit, 
with the noise of a great tumult, he has kindled fire on it and its branches are broken. For the Lord of hosts who planted you has pronounced doom against you for the evil of the house of Israel and of the house of Judah, which they have done against themselves to provoke me to anger in offering incense to Baal. So here in Jeremiah, he refers to Israel as being this green olive tree. They have gone out and they've transgressed. Their unbelief has led to sin. And so some of their branches are broken off. Well, taking it back to what Paul was discussing, that left room for other branches to be grafted in. Connecting that to Genesis chapter 12, speaking to Abraham, God says, in you all the nations of the earth will be blessed or grafted in. So these things that Paul was discussing, again, aren't new concepts. He's just living in a day and time when he realizes, hey, this is what the Messiah came and has done, and this is what's happening. We, these things that Jeremiah wrote of, these things that Moses wrote of, these things are beginning to happen. And he sees these things. He discerns these things. He's not allowing his theology of his former days to cloud his vision of what God is doing. And God, by his Spirit, is giving him revelation of these things. And now he's trying to explain it to all of us. So with that, Revelation comes this admonition, this warning to those of us who have been grafted in. He says, don't boast. You didn't replace anybody. You're here because of your faith. So don't boast against the branches. The root is upholding you. You're not upholding anything. We're not replacing anything. Now, he continues on in verse 21. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell, severity, but toward you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, who are natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? I'm going to summarize that by saying this. Paul just refuted replacement theology. The church has not replaced Israel. The church is supposed to be part of Israel. So how would we replace something that we're actually supposed to be part of? So there is no biblical leg for replacement theology to stand on. We haven't replaced anybody. But Paul is making it very clear that as believers in Messiah, regardless of our ethnicity, regardless of what nation we were born into, we have been born again and through the Messiah have become part of this nation, the family that God calls Israel. And he also strongly insinuates that even those branches that were broken off because of their unbelief, if their eyes are opened, if the matzah is broken by Elijah, the wild branch, and their eyes are open and belief takes root in their heart and they come to believe, guess what? They're going to be grafted back in again. And personally, I don't think he would say that if that wasn't going to happen. Because God has not cast them off. He's not done with them. Olive branches can be broken off of an olive tree, lie there dormant for years, have the appearance of being dead. Nothing's going to come of it. And yet it's still possible to make a cut and graft them back into that tree years later. Paul says, or at least hints very strongly, that's what's going to happen and likens it unto life from the dead, being resurrected, being raised up that we may live in his sight on the third day. In fact, there are many other prophecies that talk about the exile and they liken the exile to death and then the subsequent restoration of the kingdom to being resurrected from the dead. Let me read a couple for you. Hosea, as a matter of fact, in chapter 3, beginning in verse 4. 
For the children of Israel shall abide many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, without ephod or teraphim. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They shall fear the Lord and his goodness and his goodness. Remember what Paul said? If you continue in his goodness. They shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. Remember what Moses said. When is this going to happen? In the latter days. Now, they shall seek David their king is not referring to the ruddy shepherd boy who was a giant slayer. It's referring to the son of David, King Messiah. We know him as Yeshua. That is to say that after many days of having no king, having no sanctuary, dead more or less, one day they're going to be resuscitated. One day they're going to be revived. One day the kingdom's going to be restored and they're going to be resurrected. And the king is going to gather the exiles from all the different nations. He's going to bring them into their land and he is going to rule and reign from Jerusalem. Yeshua spoke of this time in Matthew chapter 24. He said, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth or the land will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven of heaven to the other. And so this gathering together is, is likened to the resurrection of the dead. There is a concept in the Tanakh that teaches that Israel, the people, and her king, the Messiah, follow parallel paths. And th that's true, because if you think about it, the Messiah was killed, he, was, he died, but then he rose again on the third day. Israel has been scattered among the nations, dead, if you will, without sanctuary, without king, so to speak. They're, spiritually speaking, dead. But he has promised that he's going to raise them from the dead. He's going to resurrect them. He's going to raise them up that we may live in his sight. When? On the third day. That's the time you and I are living in prophetically. It, it says that their king is going to gather them. And as he gathers them, it is as if he is calling them out of their graves. In fact, in Ezekiel, uh, we see this in chapter 37, beginning in verse 12. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open up your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and, for, and performed it says the Lord. So is he talking about just raising dead bodies up from the grave? No, he's talking about bringing them back into their own land. They've been scattered among the nations, cut off from God, so to speak, because they turned to these other gods and he sent them into these other nations to serve idols of wood and stone. They're dead. But there is going to come a day that Moses spoke of that you will begin to seek the Lord your God where you're at, all these nations. It's going to happen in the end days. And you're going to begin to seek Him and He's going to, he's going to remember you. And here Ezekiel says that He's going to call them up out of their graves, out of their exile. He's going to resuscitate them. They're going to, they're going to be resurrected. And as it turns out, prophetically speaking, it's going to happen on the third day. So, we, I'm convinced, are living in that time. It's been two days. He's reviving us. We're at the threshold of him raising us up that we may live in his sight. We are fast approaching the end of the time of the Gentiles when he says, that's enough. You've reached that limitation. Your cup is full. And prophecy after prophecy tells us how he's going to shake the nations, he's going to break the nations, and the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God and of his Messiah. I believe we're at the doorstep of these things happening. But we're not done yet. We still got to talk some more about 
the fullness of the Gentiles. And so we'll be back in just a moment. 